So um, I'm uh, really pleased I can be with you all this morning. I'm actually in Oregon. We're visiting our our son, our youngest son and his family. So uh, that's why the late start. So I also appreciate you being willing to do this so late because it's actually pretty early here. Uh, so uh, I'll just speak for a few minutes. Uh, this is a, uh, a great question that Mervi and Hanale came up with and what's the kind of systemic change that's most needed in the world today. And I, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, that's a question that obviously all of us need to be thinking about. And, you know, really good questions don't have answers. They have a power because they're timely. And they get us thinking about things that otherwise we might be so busy dealing with the uh, immediate, the crises, all the things that occupy us, that we kind of forget about where we're really trying to go. So I I really appreciate this question, not because I think I have anything particularly unique or particularly important to say about it, but I think it's a really good question, at least for me. It's a very meaningful one. Um, the term systemic change and systems thinking and syst even the very word system is, is a little bit tricky. Uh, often my find, now this will be different in different cultural settings. So I don't know if what I'm about to say is accurate for the Finnish culture. I have, a, by the way, a great appreciation, very limited, but great fondness for the Finnish culture. We've had about a oh, 20 year partnership with Team Academy, an organization which I'm sure many of you know. And to me, it's, it's taught me a lot about the spirit of innovation and imagination, playfulness of the Finnish culture and ability to balance that with really being serious and rigorous. And I think those are in some ways the kind of qualities we're gonna need in the world. We're gonna to need to be very playful, imaginative, and really try very different things, be we open. And yet on the other hand, this is a very serious play. So that kind of metaphor of serious play may be a very good guiding image for us going forward. Um, so we had a chance to talk, uh, Mervi and Hanalee and I a little bit I, of course, know a little bit about the background of Citroen and our conversation a few days ago. They were able to fill me in a little bit more on the program, the fund, and the kind of work that's been done and, and kind of as backdrop for our conversation today. As many of you uh, may know, uh, my background is in systems, so that's why I always ponder a little bit at the beginning or pause on this word system. The, the problem with the word is it, it strikes people as very technical. And if you look at the common use, at least in my cultural context, again, I don't know in Finland, when people use the word system today, they typically refer to computer systems. And, you know, we have a systems problem. We need a systems expert here. Um, or uh, rules and regulations. No, it's not my fault. It's the stupid system. When we say things like that, we're usually pointing at uh, rules and regulations and things that constrain us. Um, but all the word system is doing is pointing to, a, uh, I, in my personal opinion, a very deep emergent understanding in science and Western science. It's an old understanding. In a sense, we're rediscovering what people have known for millennia, certainly as long as civilizations have been successful, that the world is extraordinarily interconnected, interdependent. No one is in charge of a force. The forest is in charge of the forest. And everywhere we look in the living world, we see interdependence. No life arises on its own. No species exists in a niche all by itself with no other species. At every level, down even to the individual organism, this extraordinary mind, body, heart system is an extraordinarily interdependent phenomenon. So that's all the word system is about. It's about kind of orienting us, orienting us to interdependence, that we have to pay attention to that. Excuse me a second. And that interdependence is, is a defining feature of the realities we all live in. It's, it's in a sense, I always see it as a way that Western science has been waking up to what people have understood for a very long time. But the way our society works, 
in many ways is strongly influenced by the arc of Western science really for the last 250, 300 years, which by and large is very oriented towards technical, towards uh, seeing things as isolated, you know, kind of Newton's billiard balls are a kind of a, a kind of a metaphoric example of the of the Western mindset. Uh, Western science historically very uh, mechanical. In fact, literally the image that was used by Newton, he called the universe God's clockwork. So the clock, which was a mechanical invention, very, very important, restructured society in many, many ways 400 years ago, became kind of a metaphor for a world that's more mechanical than alive. And of course, a clock has a lot of interdependent pieces. I'm trained as an engineer. In engineering, we understand engineering systems, but there are a lot of separate mechanical things that interact, a clock being a good metaphor. There is a systemness there, but it's very different than the systemness of this system. It's taken really until the uh, last uh, 30 or 40 years that in biology, we have a kind of consensual definition of what constitutes a living system as opposed to a mechanical system. The term autopoiesis emerged from the work of a very famous Chilean biologist named Humberto Maturana, who passed away uh, just uh, two weeks ago now at the age of 92. Autopoiesis means self-creating, auto, self Poesis is the Greek root of the uh, English word poem or poetry to create. A living system creates itself. It's autopoetic. It's a beautiful, very simple, elegant definition of what constitutes a living system that's different from a machine. A machine does not create itself. It's created by another. It's called allopoetic in biology as opposed to autopoetic. So I'm just using this to illustrate, despite all the sophistication and advances of modern Western science, in many ways, this huge blind spot towards the interdependent living nature of reality. To most traditional societies, and when I say traditional, I really mean uh, uh, indigenous or native societies, everything is alive. Of course, we know in the Western culture, and again, and I'm using science as a point of reference, we have the quote, physical sciences. The physical sciences are sciences of what's not alive. But to native cultures, there's nothing that's not alive. The rocks are alive. And now we now know from a more contemporary scientific view that that's not crazy. Everything is in motion. Some things are moving more slowly than others. The earth as a living system is now a theory that's widely at least acknowledged in science called the Gaia hypothesis that all life on earth collectively constitutes a systemic phenomenon. And of course the term Gaia, another ancient Greek term for mother earth. The Gaia hypothesis again is taking us back thousands of years in a way to a view of the universe and our living planet here as life. So I'm just kind of using all this to set the stage. Um, this question that Mary V posed to me is a great example of a, of a deeply reflective question. Yeah, we can have an answer of, you know, what kind of systemic change the world needs. But the real question is, why is this question so important? And the reason the question is so important is it invites us to reflect on the arc of our culture. To me, a very simple way to express our predicament right now, we actually don't know how to live together on this small planet. It's pretty simple. To live means to live in a way that you're sustained, that you're uh, vibrant, that you even thrive in a way that so do others. And we don't know how to do that with, you know, 7 billion people interacting with uh, a much larger tapestry of living systems. 
And if we don't learn how to do that, uh, we probably are in big trouble. Well, you could say we're in big trouble right now. And this reason programs like Citra exist to get thoughtful people in positions of influence in society really thinking together about the kind of world we live in. So when I thought, um, thought about this question, um, I thought, well, this is a huge question. We can talk for a long time. I'm not going to talk for very much longer. Um, but how do we even begin to frame it? And, and what arose to my mind when I was thinking after we talked a couple of days ago, Mervi and Hanali and me, um, that um, we could use climate change as a framework. Now, climate change is in many ways the kind of uh, most visible example that we are increasingly around the world sharing our attention on as an example of we don't know how to live. We're living in ways that we're borrowing from the future to support our current lifestyle. The, the, the way we live today will have many, many consequences for our great grandchildren. In a sense, we're making them the, the debtors of our way of living today. So it's a perfect example of what's unsustainable about our current way of living. So it kind of gives us a window. I also think in some ways, climate change is very simple. And it does have a lot of basic science behind it. So in a way, the enormous complexity of the social, economic, ecological challenges we faced are huge. We can use climate change as a kind of a way to focus in. And in particular, what I mean is it gives us a sense of timing. That's very hard to say we live out of balance with Mother Earth. Humans don't know how to live in harmony with nature and each other. Maybe fine, but it, that could be a problem that we have two centuries to solve. How do we know how urgent this problem is? In a way, climate change gives us an answer to that. We know in a sense there's a curve that defines our modern world, this kind of accelerating curve of growing greenhouse gas emissions. In a way, it is the icon of this present way we live. This very, very simple little curve. And this is my high tech part of the presentation. By the way, when we're all done, I'm a, I'll give um, for Mervi and, and Holly a link to what I think is the best platform today for really understanding the dynamics of climate change, which I'm going to talk about, which is a set of freeware simulators that we've developed at MIT over the last 30 years that are available on a website called Climate Interactive. So this is Peter's sketch of the sophisticated uh, simulation tools that have taken over 30 years to develop. But we could never talk about them in such a short period of time. But we all know the curve, right? The curve has been one like that, right? Things are accelerating. We could call that the curve of industrialization. We could call that the curve of um, humans thinking they're in control of the universe, the industrial mindset that puts us humans in the center. But specifically, I'd like to think of it as just simply the, the historic exponential growth of greenhouse gas emissions. It's kind of the defining feature of climate change. And around the world, this is a huge change of the last 20, 30 years. Uh, all different countries, doesn't matter if they're Western, Eastern, China, America, Finland, Latin America, Africa, we all realize our destiny is kind of connected around this historic growth of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, uh, that are out of control. And I think if we just think about the simplest things we can say scientifically about this, it'll frame this conversation and this question that Mervy has asked in a, in a way that hopefully we can really think together about it. So first off, the history is pretty simple. It's been growing exponentially, right, this curve. Um, we know that can't continue. Already today, we're in an area where uh, global average mean temperature has risen about a 
1.3 or 4 degrees centigrade beyond what it was before the industrial era. That doesn't sound like very much. One and a half degrees C doesn't sound like very much. Yet we look around the world, the extraordinary problems in the world. One of the common problems we all wrestle with, the global migrations. It's hugely politically disruptive throughout Europe. It's hugely politically disruptive in my country, in the United States. Why are people moving all around the world like they are? Well, there's no single cause more common than climate destabilization. Floods, droughts, the destruction of traditional agricultural land that's no longer productive or economically viable for people, the resulting political chaos in these countries, driving people to make one of the hardest decisions a human being ever has to make. We have to leave. I, my family, we have to kind of organize whatever possessions we have and migrate. We kind of look at the consequences of this living in the wealthy northern countries like ours. But if we put ourselves in the shoes of the people doing this, we realize this is a not an easy decision. What would compel people to do that? Well, obviously, there's deeply disruptive dynamics going on. And climate change is one of the prime drivers of these. But that creates a situation where, we, where our main leadership options are reacting. So when we're just seeing this curve and we see the consequences and we feel that whether it's uh, the effect on food systems or the effect on water or the direct effect on temperature in terms of storms, uh, typhoons, hurricanes, droughts, or the, the social implications like massive migrations of people all around the world, mainly towards Northern, what they perceive to be relatively more stable places they might move to. Sitting behind them is this crazy curve, this accelerating growth of greenhouse gas emissions. And the consequences it has, first just talk about the natural environment. The accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's like a giant bathtub, all these greenhouse gases accumulate and they are a blanket around the earth. They add to increasing uh, capture of energy, warming the planet. And even though, as I said, one and a half degrees C increase in temperature doesn't sound like much, look at everything that's happening in the world today, just from that amount of increase in the global mean temperature. But what's really significant about climate change, of course, is we're at the beginning. As that curve continues, unabated, unchanged, we will get to two degrees C. It's almost a sure thing today. Even though the politicians say, no, no, we have to stop before we get to two degrees centigrade, we're virtually there now from the inertia in this system. I'm an engineer by training. Inertia is a very important concept in engineering. It's a very important concept in natural systems. Once in motion, things are not easy to get out of motion. Um, three degree C, four degree C, these are the kind of worst case scenarios that climatized scientists tell us we're headed towards without significant change. It's almost impossible to imagine the amount of disruption in our societies. The cause of this. So I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is say we could use climate change as kind of a window onto we actually don't have centuries. The general consensus amongst climate scientists is this decade, the 20s, 2020s, is critical. If there aren't significant changes by now, we really start to get on a path where we are headed towards a three degree C world. So we can start to use climate change to calibrate, to begin to get a sense of timing. And the last point I want to make is phasing. So when I thought about your question there today, I immediately thought of, oh, well, there's kind of three phases that we have to think about. And by the way, these phases will stretch through the 21st century. The phase we're in right now is the crisis phase. We all see the crises, like migration. 
we all see the weather destabilization. In a time of crisis, all of your emotions and all of the societal forces, the political pressures are to react. And you have to react. As Greta Thunberg said, if your house is burning down, you have to put out the fire. But the metaphor doesn't really go far enough because the real question is why is the house burning down? What are the longer term trends? Because just reacting will not change the underlying systemic sources of these problems. And we don't have centuries to begin to reverse these systemic sources. So if we think of the curve, where we're at right now, and I'm just trying to use this to calibrate, to give us more sense of timing. Where we're at right now is we're all waking up and recognizing that something needs to change. Countries around the world, China started to move towards uh, reducing uh, CO2 emissions 20 years ago. I was in China when they made their first significant their targets they set to use the 2010s. By 2020, they want to achieve a 40 to 45% reduction in carbon intensity of the entire economy. And that was in 2010 at the uh, annual big Congress, People's Congress. So around the world, people are kind of waking up to the crisis. At the same time, we're dealing with the consequences of the crisis. So the terminology that the climate scientists have developed is probably a good one. There's mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation means you're trying to deal sensibly with the crisis that's in front of us right now. Like, what do we do about the massive global migrations? Adaptation says the deeper systemic problems require us to adapt. We have to change how we live. We don't even know what that means. Obviously, we start by decarbonizing, shifting our energy source. But that's just a big one part, a tangible part of the underlying problem. The North lives at the expense of the South. It's a very simple way to say the social reality. The amount of inequity that's grown in the world in the last one to two decades is almost impossible to have us to imagine. You know, this crazy situation where now uh, eight to 10 people living mostly in North America have more wealth than the poorest half of the world combined. I mean, it's bizarre. So while we look at this period of crisis, we have to react. We have to mitigate the consequences as best we can. But then we have to use it as a window of opportunity to think more deeply. How do we need to adapt? How do we need to change? This, this first phase, this crisis phase, will kind of come to an end if we're successful when that curve stops rising, it's rising around the world. But when it stops rising, that's not the end. That just means we've slowed the growth of carbon emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions. Now we have to start bringing them down. We have to start bringing them down until the emissions going into the atmosphere, think of it again as a big bathtub, is now in balance with carbon removals or greenhouse gas removals, sequestration. That's why forestry is so important. That's why forestation, deforestation is such a powerful force in the world. Because not only is emissions going up, but removals is being compromised by deforestation. Eventually, these two curves have to come together. That's the point of real carbon neutrality. However, that's just the end of the second phase. That's the phase I would call it getting our act together. We're starting to really slow this growth and start to bring down the growth in global emissions. At that point, when those two curves cross, the emissions coming down, it finally hits removals. That's not the end of the problem. Because by that point, the bathtub level the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, which is what is driving climate destabilization and rising global temperatures, will probably be somewhere around 450 to 500 parts per million CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. That's the kind of measure 
the scientists use. Before the industrial age started, that level was about 300 parts per million. So even though we've stopped the growth of the curve, we brought the curve down, we're now entering the third phase, which is when we have to start to significantly lower. The technical term is draw down the level of greenhouse gases. That era of drawdown will not start until 2050, perhaps. It'll continue throughout the 21st century by any conservative measure. This is a problem of the century. It's not centuries, but you see now we have a calibration. We have 10 years to get our act together. We have another 20 or 30 years to start to bring down this growth of emissions until it intersects with removals. And then the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stops growing. At that point, we need to bring it down, bring down that level of greenhouse gases down, because that's what's driving climate destabilization. So just to summarize, to calibrate, we have, I would say this decade to really slow this rising curve we have probably two to three decades to bring it down to the point where greenhouse gas emissions once again equal sequestration, the drawing down of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And then we have another probably 50 years where we can slowly draw down the level of concentration. This is a problem of the century, not just of this decade. So I wanted to use that to kind of offer a time frame, And it's a very simple way to begin thinking about your question, Murphy. and I'm gonna end here and give you a little time to reflect on this. So it seems to me there's a couple of implications for your question. What do we need to be able to do we can't do now? What are the new capacities of society? needs to be able to develop. One is this next 80 years needs to be real to us. It, it's, it's an impossible thing to think about given the way our societies have functioned. We all know, we all have politics. Believe me, China has politics. Everybody has politics. And politics usually demand people work on a two-year time frame, maybe a five-year time frame. And now we're saying it's a, no, it's a, a century-long time frame. What does that take? And how do we think of the earth as a whole? Because the picture I'm just painting for you is a picture not of Finland, not of America, not of China, not of Brazil, but of the earth. So those are the two obvious implications of this. How do we stretch out our time frame to think about the dynamics we will need to guide ourselves through for this century? And we don't have forever to start. And how do we think about that globally? Okay, I should end there because we want to give you a little time to reflect on this in small groups. So the question I would say at this point, given my kind of comments, if they make any sense at all, I hope they do. Um, what questions do they raise for you? As people in your positions, living in your country, and as citizens of the world, what are the kind of questions that this simple way of framing our predicament using climate change, again, just as a window, I'm not saying that everything in the world is about climate change. I'm just saying, because there's so much science here and a lot of it is kind of natural science and it's actually not complicated. It gives us a time frame to think about these periods of getting our act together now, dealing with the crisis in a way that we don't just react to the crisis, that's a big problem by itself. Then this transition over the next two or three decades of bringing that curve of emissions down till we're once again in line with the um, what nature removes from the atmosphere, sequestration. You could call that the period of real change. And then after that, the next three, four, five decades of actually drawing down the level of greenhouse gases, which means we are living in a very, very different way. 
Our global emissions are less than sequestration for a long enough period of time that the concentration of greenhouse gases actually starts to come down again to what we know is harmonious with at least a species like ours. Okay, so I think now we go into breakout groups. What yes. questions does this stir up? Yes, so just a brief reflective discussions to you know wind down and make some room for the other questions and insights you have emerging at the moment. So Anna-Lena is ready to send you off to the breakout rooms for a few minutes and then we shall return here.